This is the Moonlight Graham Show, a freewheeling conversation with the role players, the underdogs, and guys with flat out great stories in sports. Hello and welcome back to the Moonlight Graham Show, where we celebrate the role players and the underdogs in sports. And our Moonlighter for today is is one of the OGs. He's one of the original Moonlighters. We had him on, I think, on the fourth episode we ever did here on the podcast. He is a true underdog. He's a true Moonlighter. His name is Jack Brownlee. So Jack Brownlee was the point guard for the only state championship basketball team my high school has ever had over at Fort Dodge St. Edmund. They won the state championship in the year 2000. Brownlee was the stud on that team. He scored 36 points in the state championship game. He was the captain of the state tournament team. He was awesome. He was simply a great high school basketball player. Even though he's about 5'10", 140 pounds in high school, he competed you know, at the AAU level with Kirk Heinrich and Nick Collison. And so he really has become friends with some some really, you know, great NBA players too through the years. And he's he's just one of those classic basketball junkies. The guy lives and breathes basketball even to this day. After high school, he went on and he had a good career at Kirkwood Community College. And then after that, he actually walked on at the University of Iowa, where he played with the likes of Jeff Horner and Greg Bruner and Adam Haluska. And, you know, during those great Steve Alford years, great might be a a stretch, but, you know, they had some really, really strong Hawkeye teams during that era. Many memorable teams if you're a, a fan of college basketball. And Brownlee, he's always fun to talk hoops with. He's always fun to bring here on the pod. And so I wanted to bring him back on the podcast because in recent, you know, conversations I've had with Jack, he's got a young son, Ben Brownlee, who's four years old now. So obviously very young, but older than my sons. And we were talking about how we want to raise our kids in sports. And so Jack lately has been doing this thing called Basketball Buddies, where he's getting like basically neighborhood kids together and hoping to try to make basketball fun in an pretty unorganized environment so it's you know they're getting some gym time they're having the kids run around but they're just trying to make sports and basketball fun for their kids so i thought i'd bring jack on we we talk hoops and we talk about how to raise our kids in sports and and you know kind of that fine line of everybody talks about not wanting to fall into the trap of of travel sports you know it's all about travel sports now and it's not really leading to better results when it comes to developing kids or really to developing athletes but how to you how do you resist that as a as a parent as a father as a coach when that seems to be the way everything is going we know it might not be the best way but it seems hard to stay out of that game as well so I wanted to bring Jack on to talk about those hoops to talk about you know, parenting and coaching as well. And always enjoy it. Always enjoy chopping it up with, with Jack Brownlee. I think you guys will enjoy it too. So enjoy today's episode with Moonlighter, Jack Brownlee. Moonlighters, are you or someone you know moving down to Kansas City? Well, if you are, the one realtor that we trust and yet you need to be calling is the great Brian Sandvig. As you well know, Brian Sandvik is our producer here on the podcast, and there is not a better residential real estate advisor down in the Kansas City marketplace than Brian Sandvik. Call Brian Sandvik, shoot him a text. Hey, DM us on social media. We'll get you connected with Brian if you can't find him on all the socials, but he is there and he is active, and he is your Kansas City realtor, so give him a call. It's a Fort Dodge reunion here on the Moonlight Graham Show. We got one of the OG Moonlighters, Jack Brownlee, in the house, along with Fort Dodge sports nut, Mark Daniel. Mark, uh, longtime listener of the pod, longtime supporter. Thanks for joining us in the studio tonight. I don't know how, how much you're, you're really nervous about putting that microphone close to your face right now. So I don't know if you're going to speak, but welcome to the pod, Mark. Thanks. There he goes. Jack I was looking the other day. It's been six years since you were originally on the podcast. Six years. A lot's changed from now to then. We moved from the top floor in this house to the basement, uh, kind of like our careers. At one point, we were, we were both flying high, and now nobody nobody cares but this podcast. Just keep about, moving down. <laughs> just keep going down. So we have Peter Jock on on the pod, one of your one of your protégés, if you will, uh, recently. What, as you were listening to that podcast, your name got mentioned a couple of times. Uh, what's it been like to like track Peter Jock's career as somebody you coached 10 plus years ago? 
you know, and then hearing him on the podcast, qualifying for the Olympics, like just what's that like for you? Um, first of all, I want to be on record that I didn't just listen to the pod because somebody told me my name was mentioned uh, during the jock interview. Um, but yeah, he's been, he was one of my favorite kids um, to coach. I love just learning about his story, um, what he had to go through, what is his family, you know, coming from Africa, coming to a, you know, America. And just w- when I first met him, he told me that, you know, he's the worst basketball player ever that, you know, he didn't know what he's doing and, but he had fun and just, um, what really stu- uh, stood out to me was somebody who just picked up the game, um, hadn't played much, played soccer. Typically, um, those, those guys have really good feet, but sometimes, um, they're trying to catch up with their hands because they grew up playing soccer and Jock you know, from the day I started watching him, the footwork and the mechanics and the shooting was so impressive that, um, I thought, you know, this, the sky's the limit for this kid because he's already got that touch. You know, he just needs to kind of fine tune everything. And he was such a hard worker. And, and I was there when he was like bow, uh, battling and that knee injury and, you know, playing for us as a junior with that, with his knee, basically, you know, not allowing him to do anything and just kind of struggling throughout the year because of the knee and um, just kind of persevering through that and just working. And um, he's, again, I just have a lot of respect for him because of what he went through and, and, and being able to go through that and, and stay laser focused to his goal and his dreams. Um, a lot of respect for him. When you were coaching at Valley, you're coaching with a couple of your buddies. You know, you're coaching with Jeff Horner, you're coaching with J.R. Angle. Was it a challenge to coach with your friends? Because uh, there's role dynamics of a staff. You know, like as an assistant coach, you don't want to be, you know, in front of the team overstepping what, you know, Horner's saying. You know, you guys like to clown on Jr. a little bit. You can't really do that in front of the team because you don't want the the kids to be following your lead. What was that like to like the dynamic of coaching with your friends? Sure, I mean, you you know, everybody with their friend group has their own dynamic, and you know that that was one thing that you know we tr- I tried to do, but again, we're such clowns anyway that it it came out. But um, but yeah, like Peter's junior year, I was I was just. Um, a volunteer assistant. So, you know, I had another job and so it was hard for me to get to all of those practices, you know, and be there full time, um, bring people because I, I felt like I, I wasn't there enough to really try to captivate a whole team. So I, I, I like to do my work uh, one-on-one kind of off to the side. And, and, and that's kind of how I fell in love with coaching. Um, just getting to know, know guys on a one-on-one level and, um, and so, yeah, so that for that year, Jock's junior year was, you know, I was there most of the time, but, um, but yeah, the dynamic is just different. And then, um, and then the next year I was a sophomore coach. I was a, you know, paid sophomore coach. So I was there much more. And, um, and so I felt like after that year, I was able to really coach guys the way I felt like I wanted to say the things I wanted to say and tried to motivate and Jeff was always the best as at the head coaching spot to one, listen to me, but to allow me to coach those guys, even if maybe my ideology was a little bit different than his. Um, I think from our playing days, he, JR two, he gave us um, kind of a, a, a longer leash to let us really try to operate that way. What were you good as? good at as a coach and what did you struggle with i've said this i i if if i hit the lottery didn't have to work tomorrow if i had to do something the rest of my life it'd be a high school basketball coach it was you know i just felt like it was so fun it was at the it was at the perfect level um for me and i look you know i i'm in sales now and so i look back at uh, those years that i coached and there's a lot of parallels there on relationship managing and trying to, you know, figure out, uh, how to motivate each kid based on their personality and what they, what they need, not necessarily what I think, you know, understand that everybody's cut 
not the same as me. And I've kind of used that to in my professional world of how to read people, how to how to talk to people, how to basically be friends or, or you know, business you know partners with. And so that was that was my favorite part is really getting to know where each kid, how they how they would how they tick and and how they how they drew motivation and try to cater that specifically to each one of them. What'd you struggle with? Um I I've said this, I've said this a lot. Uh I I love coaching. I my sweet spot of coaching would be with players that have a good understanding of the game, uh players that have kind of are motivated to maybe play in college. Uh so their skill levels high. Uh, fairly high that I could kind of help mold into uh, a, a better player to reach kind of their goals or dreams. I struggled with people who, with kids who may not necessarily less skilled, that's okay, but just mentality wise, um, you know, people who, who weren't, you know, I guess. They didn't care. They weren't as engaged. They weren't as engaged. They weren't like, you know, just as intense as maybe I was. Um, so I always thought to my, I always thought I could be as a coach, I could take a a pretty good player and I could figure out ways to get them to be an elite player. But I struggle with maybe somebody who's, who's struggling a little bit and not super into the game, getting them to be just a good player. That was, that was where I struggled because if, if somebody didn't have the passion for the game or they didn't, um, they didn't want. They didn't really want to get better for for themselves, or just wanted to list. You know, those are the things that I, I struggled with because, you know, from my past, I've always I've been obsessed with the game since I was a little kid, and um, I understand it's not that's not everybody, but for me, like that that communication um, was a little hard for me. So, if you're a good player, I'd. I would be a good coach for you if you struggled or you weren't <laughs> into it. I, I just wasn't a good coach for those people. I, you know, Bobby Knight passed recently, and I don't know if you guys did this, but I I was on like the Bobby Knight rabbit hole on Twitter for a couple of days and because there are just infinite amounts of stories about Bobby Knight. And one of them that I, I thought was funny, or it was actually Alford. Alford said this on the Dan Patrick show. He said that, you know, the, the story about, about Bobby Knight was he would make average players good and he would make great players good. <laughs> you know, that was kind of the, the knock on Bobby Knight, right? Is because to fit into his system, like you grew in a lot of different areas, but like as, as an individual, sometimes you had to give up so much to fit into Bobby Knight's system, which is so interesting because at the same time, you know, the there's also that story about Bobby Knight with the, the Olympic team in 84 and Michael Jordan, where like he was the first mover on Jordan and he let Jordan do everything. But it probably took a rare breed of competitor to to kind of live up to the standard of, of Knight. Right. And Jordan didn't lack for talent and he didn't lack for for competition. And I, I've always thought from a coaching standpoint. You know, it's it's taking bringing up that that middle class that sometimes it's the toughest piece because as coaches we always want you always want to take the Peter Jocks of the world and work on them one on one, but it's the making the ninth guy or the eighth guy a solid contributor at the end of the year. Those are the ones that really can can change from mediocre team to you know the next level. Yeah, I mean, so I I compare this sometimes parenting um, of my two little kids that sometimes it's just exhausting with, you know, trying to whatever they're doing naughty. And I, sometimes I'll say to my wife, it's, and I I relate this to like basketball. It's so much easier to get somebody to ramp down like your kids versus trying to get somebody to ramp up. Yeah. And that was, that was one thing like with Bobby Knight, I think was, um, he didn't have time to waste to try to ramp somebody up. It's almost impossible. Once they get to college, if, if there's, if there's some kind of something lacking motivation wise, they're done. Like there's the, once they get there, if they're not really super engaged, you can't really fire somebody up um, at that stage. And so sometimes I'll, I'll tell Jenna, my wife that, Hey, I'd, I'd much rather have to ramp our kids down 
from act, what they're doing or how they're acting or how passionate they're about they are about whatever they're doing versus trying trying to get them to show some semblance of of passion or energetic behavior and so that i think there's some parallels there with basketball for sure so i coached middle school but i had like a seventh grade and then an eighth grade traveling team same group of kids two years in a row seventh grade and then eighth grade and what i noticed a couple of things i struggled with with that age was it was a traveling team but i was kind of hired by the parents to do a traveling team outside of the regular system right they didn't want to play for the all iowa attack they didn't want to do they wanted to do something else that they had more control over so it wasn't just you know tournament every weekend tournament every weekend tournament every weekend there was more focus on the fundamentals but what i struggled with was you'd play these teams and it'd be full court press you know all day every day um, every offense was just a ball screen offense. There was no movement. Everything was zone defense. And so as a, as a coach that wanted to go in and be, you know, I, I'm going to sell out for this, right? We're going to stick to man to man defense. We're not going to full court press. We're going to do it. What I consider the right way. It's tough when every other team is selling out for the sake of, of wins instead of building fundamentals. And so I struggled with that because we would, you know, we won a couple of tournaments and we won more games than we lost. But like if we would have given in and done it the way that every other traveling team does it, we wouldn't have got we wouldn't have developed the kids as well. But we would have won more games. What age were they? It was it was seventh grade and then and then in eighth grade or no, it was sixth and seventh. It was sixth and then seventh, not eighth grade. So sixth grade and then seventh grade. And so every team we'd play, it was just five core, five, a zone press, and then back into a zone defense, and you know ball screen offense if there was one. And I just I really struggled with with that as a coach. I absolutely hate it. Um, and my kid, my kids aren't that old yet, but going to my nephew's games over the years, and sometimes I feel like, oh, man, am I just getting too old? But I, and I, I I like I'll compare a lot of things to to my past or like my upbringing and of course winning and losing losing more teaches a lot of things you know as a fifth sixth grader so that's important I guess but um I think it's just awful I think I I I seriously don't think they should keep score until you know people are close or going through puberty honestly it's, I don't, I think it should be man to man, no press. Um, and here, one of the big reasons why is this was even, this wasn't as serious when I was coming up, but there are, you know, the wins and losses for these sixth grade, seventh grade teams are important. Parents, coaches, they want their kids, their teams to win, which is important. But, but I look back at the teams that were always winning these tournaments when I, when, you know, my St. Ed's team would go traveling and when I got to junior, senior year, none of those guys were around. Like either – it might not be because they were just trying to win games and they were playing zone and they weren't really being taught the fundamentals. But there's something to be said, I think, of having importance just strictly being winning or losing um, because the most important time if you're a basketball player isn't seventh grade, eighth grade. That means nothing for your future if you're a good basketball player as a freshman, sophomore, mainly junior and senior year, that's when you can really shape your, your entire life and your future. And the people, I just felt like the people that were really stressed on winning games and having their teams press because they were faster than the other team. It's bad for everybody. And if the goal, which it shouldn't be is to play college basketball. If that's your, if that's your kid's goal or the, the team you're coaching, if you if that's a goal, it in seventh grade you should care less about winning. Again, kids should, but the parents should care less about winning and just seeing s- certain improvement from from little fundamental things like okay, now he's coming to a jump stop. Now he's really guarding and he's watching. You know, everybody he's able to see more than just his man, or you know, he's 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 becoming a really good ball handler, confident. You know, and those are the things that if the goal is to be a good basketball player when you're in high school or to go to college or whatever, those are the things that are important. Not we just press this team because they, you know, they were slow and they 
We beat them by 35. Well, right. And, you know, you're talking about development as an individual, but I, I also think like the game is more fun when you're playing it that way. Like when you go play pickup, right? When you just go out and play pickup, you don't play zone defense. You don't press, you know, you, you play man to man. And like, because that is the game of basketball. That is the international game. If like, you're going to find a game anywhere in the world and just to plug into that game, you guard your guy, five guys up and down, moving the ball, setting screens for others. And like, you just don't learn that. And I think one of the really discouraging things about it is, is it's the parents fault. Like this is a hundred percent on the parents because what's happened is over the last 20 years, businesses have realized this is a good business strategy. We can trick a lot of parents into selling out and, and creating fear that if they're not doing this, their kid is going to fall behind because every kid, every parent is obsessed with their kid getting a scholarship. And, you know, basketball is a great example because essentially if you're under six, five, like essentially what you're doing is trying to get your kid into a division three school. So like, your kid is not going to play division one basketball. And just, if you're listening, your kid is not going to do it. I don't care how good he is. He's not going to play division one basketball, but they're convincing parents. If you're not doing this, and this goes for basketball, this goes for baseball, this goes for football. Now and I'm living by Valley high school. They have third grade tackle football tournaments, Sunday mornings at eight o'clock over here. And so it's just this fear that if we're not doing this, we're falling behind and you you look at what's happened, especially in basketball, because America is, is slipping. Like we saw it in the World Cup this year. We've seen it in the Olympics. And even if you look at the last, what is it, five MVPs in the, in the NBA, none of them are American, right? And, and what happens is in, Amer- in, in, the, in Europe, you know, youth teams practice five days a week and they play two games a week. In America, it's inversed. They practice twice a week and they play five games a week. And every th- all the emphasis is on winning and losing and about these money-making machines instead of about actually developing better players. And to your point, basketball, baseball, football, all the sports are best when you're 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. Because at that point, you're mature enough to actually play the sport. But they're, burning, they're playing so many games as kids and kids are... Are, don't have any opened weekends anymore that they're typically quitting the sport before they ever get a chance to actually play the sport when they're 15, 16, 17 years old because they're burned out on it because they've, they've got idiot parents that burned them out when they're eight, nine years old. And this is starting now at like five and six, right? And so of course they're going to be burned out when they're seven, eight, and nine because they, they're not actually playing the real sport and they're not actually allowed to have a childhood. And it's, it's so concerning that you know you and i are in similar boats here marky as well we're like we're parents of of kids that are are pretty young at this point but the challenge is going to be resisting the temptation to get your kid involved in this at a young age and how so how do you keep your kid out of the system for as long as you can and i think the best example of this is like archie manning with peyton and eli like he wouldn't allow his kids to play organized sports until they were in seventh grade The benefit of that for Archie Manning is like he knew his kids were going to be good because he was an incredible athlete. So it's like, oh, my genetics are going to be strong. Not everybody has that same benefit. But I think the truth of it or the the point of that still holds true. And also, um, like you're never going to know if your kid is good or not at something until they're like probably 12, 13 years old anyway. Yeah. And again, just me looking back at my past, um, I was a little bit slow developing physically, maturity wise. And so I wasn't, again, I wasn't the, I felt like the best player of my Ford Dodge St. Edmund team until maybe I was a junior in high school, maybe. And so, um, at that, you know, as eighth grade, ninth grade, a little bit of 10th grade, very, I, I just, I'm just worried that so many people may have looked at it like, Hey, I'm not getting recruited. I'm not getting these letters. I'm not even the you know best player on my team. I'm going to try to play baseball or something because just, I would, you know, if I was impatient or if I was trying to be like, Hey, I, this isn't for me because I'm not getting this attention. If I would, you know, I, I just, I worry that I didn't hit my peak or my prime until I was a junior in high school and, and mainly really my senior year. And I'm just worried that so many kids in my, you know, 
where the size wise or whatever would give that up because they feel like they're not getting the they're not going to go play in college and that was that's another thing that really bothers me is one of the and I'm sure you can say the same thing one of the, the most fun times of my life was playing high school basketball regardless of what anybody was going to do in college it's a game it's a game I grew up loving a game I grew up loving to play and just because someone's not maybe going to play college basketball, it's still really fun. It's still a, just a game. And I think like the people who are the fourth option or the fifth or maybe even like the seventh man might be like, hey, I'm not, you know, I'm out of the mix here. They look at it that way versus this is really fun and I'm contributing, getting better, like I'm just having fun with my boys. And I, I just worry that that's something that maybe – you know, is, well, yeah, is what going away. What you're describing is like kind of the the ancillary benefits of sports, like just being on the team, right? Because if if you're viewing sports, if whether it's your parents or yourself as an athlete, as like your ticket to a college scholarship or your, you know, it, it, it's college scholarship or bust, then like you're missing the whole point of sports because the real point of sports is – the locker room, the teammates, the camaraderie. To be 40 years old and to still look back fondly at like some of the, all those memories you have um, is, it, again, so my son, he's four, and I, uh, I'm i just, I'm going to try my, my hardest to communicate that to him because basketball, you know, if I didn't play college basketball, but basketball gave me everything, and it's it's important, you know, it's not uh, a failure if you're not getting scholarships because it's it you know it's just fun. This is my this is actually my take on golf. And if you've listened to every episode of the pod, you've heard this before. I but have. here my take on golf is that there's no they should actually outlaw high school golf and all youth golf programs. I realize that the the PGA is doing everything to, you know, in the post Tiger era to get the youth back playing golf, but you've got the rest of your life to play golf. You're going to you can play golf to your 80. There's actually no reason to be playing golf as a kid because that's the time to play team sports. That's the time where you should be playing baseball, you should be playing basketball, you should be playing football because once 19 years old hits, you're probably never going to play those team sports. Like you might get lucky and and have some good rec leagues, have some good inter, intramurals, but essentially it's done. It's over for you. All you have left is golf for the next 50 years of your life, which is, and like, you can always take golf lessons. You're never going to be as good at it. Once again, you're not going to make the PGA tour parents. Your kids are not going to make the PGA tour. So quit wasting their time. Live. Uh, well, it's, it's now part of the PGA tour. I mean, it's merged that Jack. So, you know, like I, I just don't understand why people, uh, in, in, I guess you played, you were a two sport athlete in high school. You played basketball and golf. Do you regret not playing a more useful sport as a youth? No, I played golf. So my coach wouldn't get on my case about running track. (laughs) I think, I think people thought I was faster than I was just from basketball. And I, you were quick, but not fast. Yeah, I was not fast. And so I would have coaches at coach Plath would try to give me to put, be in the four by one. I was like, you don't want this. I'm not, <laughs> if we ran four, you know, a four by 20, <laughs> but, um, so I played golf, so I didn't have to play, um, run what about track, baseball? I mean, did, I, I would, I love baseball and I, I'm from like the, everybody was saying, if you, if you're serious about playing in college and you want to get noticed, you need to be on the AU circuit. And, and I let that go to my head and, didn't play baseball and baseball was, I loved it. I wasn't a very good hitter, uh, but I loved playing in the field and I loved, I just loved summertime baseball. And I quit after uh, eighth grade because I thought I just need to be going to camps and AU. And and there's probably some truth to that. And you played for Martin brothers and like you had good AU experiences, but I do think the, especially in this day and age, like getting noticed is easier than ever, right? It wasn't that way 25 years ago when you were playing AAU, but nowadays, like it's not hard to get noticed because like you don't need to just go to a future stars camp or play in a certain AAU tournament. Everybody's noticed now. So I do think now more than ever, you actually can play more sports because 
of the recruiting element has gone, uh, you know, so mainstream. But when you look back on that, do you think playing AAU served what you wanted it to do for you? It did. It absolutely did. Um, it was it was the best thing for me. Like that summer, I've talked about it on this pod before, but the summer I played with like Collison and Heinrich, where I didn't really get any any type of minutes, um, I it was so valuable, and I was able to pick up a lot, and I was just more confident that that next year. Um, but yeah, like going back to your point, I've I've said this, people, and again, I don't blame parents who haven't been through it or don't maybe understand you know all the ins and outs of how it works but i've tried to tell parents that i've talked to that you know they if their kid does have a dream of playing college whatever sport they are in they don't need to be going to every one of the events or tournaments or eight because if their if their fear is that they'll get you know overlooked or they'll they won't get noticed these college coaches are paid to put the best possible team on the floor as they could, as they can. If you're good enough to play for them, you're going to stand, you're right. They're going to find you. It's not like, well, I've got to go to this AU term in Florida with, with my team. Otherwise no one is going to look at me. If I don't play, AU. they're going to find you. If you're good enough, tape does not lie. And in this day and age, especially like, Everybody can have a tape. Everybody can see everything. Um, and so these are all – I enjoy having these conversations because I'm just trying to prepare, you know, my son and, fingers crossed, my daughter that she'll want to play sports that um, – I don't know about Elle. She, Yeah, I know. I've she, got a good good scouting report on Ben. I think I've, I've got high hopes there. Elle could surprise us. There's still yeah. plenty of time here. But – She's a wild card. She she made a basket in her driveway hoop two days ago that was six feet high. Made one shot. I've been begging her to play basketball, and she told me, I don't need it. See, Dad? I don't even need a coach. She made one <laughs> shot. She goes, I don't need a coach. So who knows? But Not um, a bad point. Huh? Not a bad point. Yeah, true. I mean, she did switch nothing but net. But, um, but yeah, I just want them to not put so much pressure on the end result because when there's so much pressure on the end result of where they want to go um, or what, what what they want to do, you know, in college or even high school, that a lot of these small victories that they have uh, will go unnoticed or they won't remember because they'll feel like everything they have to do is built up to what they're going to do in college. And I just, I just look back at, I had so much fun playing these sports and I just, I need my kids to remember that. It is a game. It's you know, kids can play it, adults play it. It's fun. It, it teaches life lessons. Yeah, I want my kids to have a healthy relationship with sports. Right. Like there's a fine line between like obsession and passion, and I want them to have a healthy passion for sports, but I hope they understand like the value of being a good teammate. I hope they understand the value of competition. I hope they understand all of that stuff that, that just it's not all about just like I need to get a college scholarship or I need to achieve this. It's like, I hope I just, I hope they see the the beauty and the value of the, all that sport is. And not just like, it's something that if I'm not on the varsity team, it's not worth me participating in. If I can't gamble on it, it's not worth doing, uh, you know, because that's kind of the dark side of sports that has become, more prominent in recent years. And I was telling Mark this, we, we got a beer before this show started taping. And, um, I was telling him how, what was I saying to you? I was, I was just talking about, uh, <laughs> how I, many I, beers did you guys have? <laughs> we had, we just had one. Um, but I was saying how uh, oh, we were talking about Mark, you got to put the mic. Go see you. Oh, sorry. First time. First timer. Um, First time, long time. We were talking about like um, our kids' sports and stuff, and it's more like more games than practice and just kind of what Ben was going to be doing, um, you know, and just kind of the thing that you had set up for him. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, we were talking about how with, again, this parenting, um, 
is like disguising how you're trying to parent your kid by making it fun. That's kind of my whole thing. You're gamifying. You're yeah, gamifying like two, uh, brushing teeth is is like a game, and trying to fin- who finishes their plate at dinner, for, just trying to disguise it. And so, um, my I have a f- Ben's a f- Ben's four, and I haven't put him in any kind of basketball leagues or anything like that. And um, I'm I got some neighbor kids. Uh, we got together, and and so we're gonna start having like practice sort of, but it's more like it's basketball buddies. It's yeah. It's called basketball buddies. And we just, I just want to introduce the game. So when they think of basketball, they think, man, that is so fun. Yeah. And by doing it just, and I'm trying to come up with creative ideas to have different games where they think they're just playing a game, but really it's like, we're teaching how to dribble or teaching, you know, pivoting and, and things like that. And so that's exciting to be creative and try to try to figure those things out because um, I don't want to come across as I'm like everybody should have a get a, part- a participation trophy. I'm not that, but I'm also a firm believer in like the long game. And and so I'm like, I don't want to have any kind of games where there's a winner and a loser. I don't want anybody to associate basketball with like a hard a hardship or like losing. I don't want um I just I don't want anybody to feel like embarrassed because they were pressed, they weren't ready for it, and they they turn the ball over a bunch, and then all of a sudden they just they don't want to like work on their game. Yeah, it's traumatic, and it's tra- <laughs> it can be traumatic, and um, and so yeah, I mean again he's only four, but I just want I want him specifically to associate basketball with like having fun with your buddies because that's. You know, that's what drove me. Like when, when no one's around, I, I went to the gym to like work on my game, not to get to get better one, but also because I, I never thought of it as where like this is just fun to like shoot or work on my game because so, I had so much fun playing and I want that to rub off on the kids I coach versus, well, God, we're beating everybody and, you know, we won by 25 and we won the championship. That's great, but let's just see how many of these kids are still out still su- succeeding and, and playing when they're 17. So what's your relationship like to playing hoops today? Because, you know, we've had guys on the podcast like like Mike Bourne, right? And you've heard, you hear guys like, you know, Jason Bauer was playing the morning game for 25 years. And you've got these guys that are, you know, still playing in their 40s and 50s, you know, that used to be high-level basketball players, but they're just always still looking for a pickup game. And then there's other guys, you know, and I don't think you've played for a couple of years. Is it, like, physically you don't want to do it anymore, or is your relationship with the game, like, if I can't do it at a certain level, I don't I don't want to do it, or, you know? No, that's not it at all. Um, because I probably could still do it at a high level of if course. I wanted to. No. Um, I was I was telling Mark I I broke my nose three times in my life once in high school as a sophomore, once at, in college at Iowa and then once uh, in twenty twenty one when I fell in the bathroom blowing up a uh, some kind of doll thing for my son, and so I don't have much cartilage left in my nose, <laughs> and so I'm just not sure I want to play. I miss it. It's it's the best. I I love myself the most when I'm on the, when I'm playing basketball, like, I feel like I'm the closest to my purpose or who I am as a person when I'm on the basketball floor. It's hard to explain, but I just, I miss it. I miss that part of it so much, but I'm like, man, I, I gotta have a nose. And so I go back and forth with like wanting to keep playing or waiting. Um, but yeah, can't wait too long. I know I can't. And, um, and so, yeah, again, basketball, and play it for so long and um i do have to give credit to the guy who's sitting here mark uh he grew up across the street from me and so he was uh what four what 10 years older than me <laughs> i don't know about 10 he's years, four about, <laughs> he's um, about four years older and so when i when i was living uh like third fourth fifth sixth grade um we used to play one-on-one and I don't know if, the, I mean, if he's just a prick or if he was trying to like teach me or get me better, but he didn't let me get one shot off on the rim. Like he would block, I don't know, you know, I don't know if you just were trying to feel better about yourself, but <laughs> he never let me get a shot off. Like, and so, um, I, I, 
again, that was one of the, it was a huge obstacle, huge struggle of mine. I couldn't get a shot, literally a shot on the rim because he'd block everything. And it was such a, like, a, a, I look back at some of the pivotal moments of my basketball career, my life of what, like changed my mentality or like whatever. And that was one of them. It was like, he's, he didn't never let up. And, um, and again, you know, I, I hate being the guy where we're looking at like current sports, but sometimes I, I'm afraid kids will be like, well, I'm not just going to play with this guy anymore. If he's going to just keep blocking my shot, it's not fun. And I just kept having this thing where I was like, I gotta, I gotta finally try to, beat this guy somehow figure out angles or whatever and so it was just it was a it was a great few years for me to 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 try to you know it humbled me but also like made me want to work harder and then um and then eventually when I became older and came back and we played a little bit when I was on Christmas break you know but, torch mark in the- but even even before then um I took you to Dodger courts all the time and we played with guys I was in school with that were older than you. So you'd be like the youngest one balling with them, um, you know, and you held your own. Um, and then I played you when you went to Iowa city and then I couldn't get a shot on you. <laughs> so question for you, Jack, when were you at your absolute peak as a basketball player? 2000 and. 15 i think 15 yeah when i was like 30 uh, what would that have been eight years so you think you were better when i was like 33 then than you were in college mm-hmm. why is that i was a little more i was stronger just my core my balance was stronger um i knew the, the game slow was all on angles just Again, I I was playing just pickup ball, but I was you were there. Like we played with some really good players. Yeah, and um, I think I th- I just think that was my peak where it was a little balance of like what I was good at in high school, but I still was like stronger and I could just limit a lot of my movement offensively and defensively where it was I wasn't just exhausted trying to run all over the place. Um, How often do you when you think back? on your career or you as a player, do you have to like remind yourself that because, you know, sometimes in our own head we can, especially when you're watching a game as an old person, because the game looks so slow on TV compared to what it is in reality. Like when I'll, when I'll watch, you know, Harding or whatever, the kid for Iowa, right. The freshman who's phenomenal. I'm like, Oh, I could have done that. You know, like you're saying that. And then you're like, actually I couldn't, no, 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 that guy's like way better, way better than, than I ever was. And I have this in baseball every now and again where I'll be like watching a game and I'll see somebody throw like a 93-mile-an-hour fastball in the corner. I'm like, oh, I could I could have done that or I, I could have thrown that slider. But you're, you're, you're tricking yourself. You know, you're lying to yourself because you're only remembering yourself at your absolute peak and, and you, realize, you forget about all the consistency it takes to compete like at that level for every pitch or every play, or all the other things that go into it. And then I'll remind myself, like, oh, no, 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 I was a mediocre for these reasons. Like, do you ever play that game with yourself where it's like you're, you're, remember seeing, you're, you're remembering yourself at your peak, but then you also could be like, Tim or Jack, uh, you also sucked at certain times too. For sure. Like, I remember sometimes we'll, we'll, I'll be watching an Iowa game, my dad will call me, and he'll, you know, my dad was – a good high school player, I guess. You know, he tells me According that. To but, him. Um, he'll call me and he'll say stuff like, I don't understand why we're not, why aren't our guys stealing the ball from the point to the wing pass? Why aren't, why aren't they just getting out there? Or, you know, and I understand, like, when you see a game, especially, like, high level, like in Iowa and Iowa State, and you're on TV and the cameras – it looks like there's space on the floor. It looks like you see from TV, you can see a lot of the, it just looks like there's way more space. And then I try to tell my dad, when you're out there, the guy's wingspans are so long. They're so tall. And there's, you know, they're so quick to be at the right place, the right time everywhere. You know, I just have these memories of like thinking, I don't see anything. You can't see anything. I can't even see the hoop. Because of the length, and um, that, that's always my reaction. My parents have, like, a couple of years ago, they got really great seats at Hilton, second row, 
uh, across from the Iowa State bench. They're incredible seats. They, they share them with another couple. And when you sit down low like that and you just see the length on the court, my, I remember the last year, the first game I went to was like Iowa State versus Texas Tech. And I thought, I don't think I'd ever get a shot off. Like, there's no way. Because you have to have you have to shoot it so quick in any hesitation, even if you if you just start the ball lower, right? The shot's blocked against guys like that. And people just don't have a great respect for that if you're watching the game on TV. Same thing with like baseball. Baseball up close, you're ne- like you can't even imagine what a 90, 91 mile an hour slider looks like. You just can't even imagine it. But that's, you know, these lies. And the longer we get away from our playing careers and the more we watch games on TV, I think ex-athletes in particular can get in this habit of, like, you know, this lying cycle that you get in. I think I'm a little bit opposite of that where I, for when I was in college and shortly after, I maybe had this um, delusional confidence in myself that I thought, you know, I, I – and I think I – think, Go, I, I think one valuable thing um, for a kid, and I'm just going basketball. I'm sure it's the same in baseball that people don't talk about is, and Peter Jock had this, is this conf, this confidence in themselves where it doesn't matter if they're playing at the Y or they're playing in the NCAA tournament, trying to shoot free throws to ice the game. It's all the same. The confidence level, it's almost a little like ignorance is bliss, like, you know, they're not even thinking about how the magnitude of the moment. They're just playing. And there's, I, I think Peyton Sanford's a lot like that, where I think he plays the same no matter the score, no matter the situation. And we were talking about this earlier. I think 75% of that is time is good. It's also can be a, a struggle too. But um, I think when I was younger, I had this kind of, like I said, this, delusional confidence in myself and my game that I don't think I would have even gotten to the level I got to if I didn't have it. Um, that if I didn't truly think in my head I was wrong, but that I was, you know, the best point guard on the team. If I didn't have that, I don't think I would have gotten as far as I get, I, as I've gotten. And then the older I've gotten, it's like, I've really shaken hands with who I am. And I think I understand what I was good at, what I wasn't good at. And I'm willing to talk about both sides of it. Um, but the older, I'm not like Uncle Rico, like I, you know, throw football over those mountains um, at my age. But when I was like 24, you know, I thought, similar to what Jock was saying in his, his interview, sometimes I thought, you know, that I was getting screwed mm-hmm. um, or whatever. And I think it, whether it's justified or not, it wasn't justified that um, – I think that con- having that confidence in yourself, if your goal is to play as high as you can play, is paramount. And I don't know if, and I, I don't know, I don't want to say it's cocky. It's it's just confidence in your game that once you're on the floor and those split second decisions you have to make, you have to think you're the best. You, you know, the, you have to think so f- full of yourself. So I, I've always had a different relationship with kind of this the self-confidence thing where I feel like I've always had kind of an inherent self-confidence, but I've never thought I was the best player on the floor or on the field at any point. I always felt like I want to bet on myself and I may not be the best player, but I'm going to win this game. And it was always more of like a chip on the shoulder of, I know I'm not the best player out here, but I'm going to win this game regardless of not being the most talented kind of thing. And I think there were certain times in high school in particular where I I probably was the best play, most talented player, especially in baseball, not necessarily basketball at at times, but like baseball and actually football at times were just, I, I think I was more athletic than people, but like really I don't know. My mindset was never like this unabashed self-confidence where I just thought I'm the best. I'm the best. I'm the best. I was like, no, no, no. I, I know I'm not the best, but I'm going to prove that regardless of if I'm, if I'm the best or not, I'm still going to win. That's extremely valuable too. like extremely valuable because I think you can speak to it, but I think it leads you to doing a lot of those little things or not allowing 
any of those like 50 50 balls in basketball or like these little plays if you have that mindset that you have to do those things to be to make a difference in your team's right uh, success it's it's valuable too there's like that happy medium of of that way or what i was just saying the middle of fence thing like you know i think i'm good but you know I, there's probably a lot of other good players like i probably don't even belong on the floor here because look at how good these guys are or how big these i the second you start like that mentality which i think i i felt that way a lot too when i when i would play at certain levels um yeah it, I, it is is not is not an option that if you if you want to play high level to have whenever i'd go to a tournament growing up whether it be whatever sport it was i would always try to find either the cockiest kid or who i thought the best kid was and i wanted to embarrass that person right that was my goal and i remember at certain times like i i got it shoved back right back in my face like I, whether uh, joel osborne was a guy i remember i in the gym sixth grade playing joel osborne for the first time and you could just tell if you watch enough games at the tournament that day like that guy's the best player in the gym and i remember just being like i'm going to shut him down because he you know he hasn't done that on me yet and he did it on me. He just, he lit me up. And, and, you know, it's one of those times where I didn't get lit up a whole lot, but him like Ryan O'Hearn, Jared Jostin got me once, you know, like some of those guys, you remember it. And that was what always drove me. I remember that in baseball in particular, like Eric Decker, remember the football player, Eric Decker, he, you know, he, I wanted to get him. He was like, he was a stud. Like the guy just looked. See for me, the E channel show. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's how I know it, uh, well, yeah, he, he got me once in baseball, but anyway, regardless of that, it's, it's like, it's that mindset. And I think some like that mindset can be a burden too. And I think it's leaked into kind of my relationship with baseball now, but because I have not watched, I'm not as close to the game of baseball as I used to be. I'm not coaching currently. I haven't pitched off of a mound in two years. Uh, I have this recurring dream of like the Iowa Cubs need a guy and they call me and I'm not ready. And it just, it's like my night, my recurring nightmare that I have probably once a month. And, uh, and because of that, it's like harder for me to watch baseball right now because I'm, I feel a detachment for the game that I think like deep down hurts. And so it's, if it's not, uh, if it's not like a meaningful game, it's hard for me to watch which is just a weird place to be with my relationship with baseball. I don't have that at all with basketball because I've been removed from basketball for so long. Uh, that baseball, that was hard. See, if I put my, my coaching hat on and uh, you know, obviously I love you Tim. I think there's, there's a lot of, you and I are very different in a lot of ways, which I really love. If I had my coaching hat on and just what you thought your mentality of like, this guy's really good. I'm going to shut him down defensively. I couldn't have enough. If I was a coach, I couldn't have enough guys with that attitude, with that mindset. Like not my mindset. Again, if I saw somebody, you know, like, uh, what's it? Ben McCollum. Oh yeah. Yeah. He so, would have, he would have been, he was your version so, of Joel Osborne. So if probably. I saw Ben McCollum, I, my head isn't thinking I'm going to shut him down. My head, my mind, I'm thinking I'm going to, give him 25 and Tennyson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and so and, and i i never and i think that it's a good healthy comparison you and i like your mentality i respect that so much more that you're like no i'm gonna guard this guy i'm gonna and so um yeah i there there's not enough couldn't have uh, enough guys on your team that have that mentality I, I just i don't know if very many do um that way where I, I, I want to guard the best player because they might fear they're getting, they're getting scored on. They're getting, they're getting lit up. They're, they're embarrassed. Like there's, there's a lot of factors that go into wanting to guard the best player on, on the other team. And, you know, kind of going back to our original conversation about the value of sport, like that's where you find out who you are in those moments, right? When it's the one-on-one -on -one battle against Ben McCollum or Joel Osborne or like you name it, where you whether whether or not anybody else cares about that matchup you care right and you, if you've got to give it your all and you're gonna you're gonna make the internal decision if you're gonna empty the chamber here and if you're gonna actually give it all you have to beat this guy to win this match and then you'll know 
right? And I think that's where when it comes to sports, and I've noticed this when coaching, that some some people are afraid to go all the way. Some people are afraid to like give it a hundred, right? They'll go to ninety. And then the last 10 is the hard part. And then you'll see them back off, right? Because they want to have a little bit margin there. We're saying, well, I didn't give it my all. And they can say when they're 40 years old, like us, that, well, I, you know, they have this fantasy of how good they were. Right. And then, you know, I could have done this. Because then it's, that. there's a, that's when you have your excuse, right? And I think the, the challenging part about sports is when you give it your all and fail, Like that was the best I had and I failed. Somebody else was better or I got beat and then going back to work, (laughs) right? And then realizing I've got to get better. I'm not good enough yet. And everything that I'm doing, I've got to change. I've got to get better. But like that self-assessment, that honesty is really, really hard. And I think maybe that piece of it is what we're losing And that's when we kind of going back circular again to like kids. When we talk about coaching basketball, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, when you play zone defense, when you full court press, it's a cheat code at that age because the skill level doesn't match up with the, the scheme. And so there's less individual accountability. So you don't need to like actually put it on the individual players, which means that you can just create this formula for success, but it's hiding the individual development. And that's kind of the sad part about it. Yeah. I mean, you see these kids um, that are pressing it, it, when they're again, when they're in youth, it's whoever has, it's, it's a race to who's you know closest physical to, you know, a grown up. Right. It's like, who's ever fat, whatever team in basketball is the fastest. Um, we'll, we'll ultimately probably win those tournaments. And again, there's so much value in losing or so much value in getting your butts kicked or, you know, how, I've said this before. Um, one thing I, as an adult now looking back uh, and seeing like being around a lot of people who are very serious about their craft and getting better and being a lead at something and seeing like the work – that you put in and I know it's, and I always thought it was just so cliche. Like that's such an easy thing to say. Like he's putting in the work to get, to get better. But, um, I've had the luxury of being very close to people who are elite at something in in my case, basketball. And I've had the luxury of knowing how hard it is to get to that level, whether it's the hard work or just, there's a lot of things that have to go right. And, even in my professional world, I, I have to remind myself, you know, I have these these goals I want to achieve, but I have to remember uh, if I want to be a lead at anything, I have to remember those people that I, I've been around in college or in high school and who were elite and, and saw kind of the work they put in and what they did, um, you know, again, when no one, nobody was watching. And I have to always remind myself that, and it's, a, again, sports gave me that where, you know, nothing's given, nothing's handed out. And, you know, you can go so far, as far with your parents pushing you or putting you in these sports and getting you on these teams and traveling. But there comes, there's at some point, wh- whether it's in sixth grade or 12th grade, that, you know, you have to be, you have to go out on your own and achieve something without anybody else's help. And, and I think that's, you know, it's just a valuable lesson that, um, I like to share with with kids that are that are young that it takes so much work to really see what you know uh, experience in your head what you think you you know a dream you have. What percentage of NBA, NFL, MLB players do you think are average workers, but God given physical size, characteristics, and talent? I don't know percentage wise, but I think, I think with anything, you know, work professionally sports, it's finite. And, you know, whether it's somebody gets a a huge deal going with work or in basketball, unless it's, unless, you know, it's the foot's on the gas and you're continuing, continuously trying to evolve and get better. All of that comes to an end sometime. Like, 
You know what I mean? Like, so there's some NBA players I'm sure that are really talented, may not love the game, but they're always been tall and athletic and everybody told them to play basketball. And so they do it. They get, they achieve some success, get to the highest level. But if that drive isn't inside them to continuously, continuously evolve and get better, it's finite. And you'll see guys that played four or five years in the league is all. And you're like, it was a stud and you wonder well it's why the average career in every major sports like two and a half years and then you right? look at like collison for a friend of the pod yeah. played in the nba 15 years right. and one thing i was going to say when you were talking about kind of how you are with you know with your with your sports and your mentality he's told me this like he's he had this thing where habits were everything and if he didn't do things the right way and didn't you know every day try to do get better and work harder and be in the right place um, that you know somebody around the world was going to take his job and and so that it wasn't necessarily like I'm be- I'm better than everybody or I'm 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 special I'm talented I should be getting shots or I should be getting post touches his mentality was like everybody's trying to get to this position. I have to do, I have to, I can't miss a layup in warmups. I can't, I have to like do everything right to keep my position in my spot. And him doing that let, allowed him to play 15 years versus maybe he would have, you know, Hey, I, I got to shoot. I got to start shooting threes and show these guys I can, you know, just avert from what got him there. And so um, it did, reminded he me. Did, oh, he did have a run where he almost became a three point shooter. I think he could. I, I, Remember I, in like year twelve, yeah, he started shooting threes. They yeah, they pushed him. They pushed him. Um, I remember in the playoffs against Memphis, he was shooting a bunch. But again, like this is kind of off topic. But I remember he came to Valley to work out one summer when he was in the NBA. And again, one year maybe they want him to shoot threes, but you know, not anywhere close to being a three point right. shooter by today's standards. And so he and I worked out at Valley one summer, and. We we're shooting, you know, five five spots, five threes at a time each spot. I just and he was shooting NBA threes. I was shooting, you know, college threes, and I'm a fairly good shooter. And I couldn't beat the guy. And I was like, these dudes are so good. Yeah, he was just I, I I couldn't beat him on any of those around the horns, and and so that put a lot into perspective. Like, and the game is even crazier now. We can talk about it, but the skill level of the players now at that level. Like you were saying, parents, your kids aren't gonna. Yeah. It's, I mean, unless your kid's seven right. feet, unless your kid's Cooper, block flag. the rim yeah. and push the break. Like these guys are aliens, and um, and so yeah, the game has just evolved so much. What's interesting about like all this stuff we're talking about sports, where it's always this underdog mentality of the harder you work, the more you're gonna get out of things, and. What I find interesting and maybe a challenge at this point in my life is all of a sudden, you know, you are putting your own aspirations aside because you've got a wife and because you've got kids. And so your your own personal goals and aspirations actually have to comes third fourth fifth sometimes in the priority of things which is a good thing because like you know i get so much joy out of being a husband so much joy out of being a father but it's it's weird to like have this mindset all all the time of like outwork 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 succeed you know strive for more and then be like you know what i'm actually going to uh pump the brakes and i'm actually going to not do that even though if i know it's going to help me achieve greater things at work because like these, you know, the, it's not my top priority. And it, I, I, it's one thing I kind of struggle with of like, you can't do, you can't be, you know, everything all at once all the time, you know, like you're going to have to sacrifice in certain areas and like you don't, at least I don't want to sacrifice at home. Right. And so then my sacrifice has to come at work, which is just a different, mindset that is now now that i have three kids and a fourth on the way it's just a different mindset for me is that breaking news we haven't announced it here on the pod so that (laughs) is yeah yeah for 
I know. Well, so that we were talking about the Elon Musk book before we got on, and like that, why that was resonating with me is like, this guy's a, he's a crappy husband, he's a crappy father, but he is able to give so much energy and time to like all the, he's running like five trillion dollar companies all at the same time. He's a father of like twelve kids, you know. Like, I mean, he sleeps on the floor of these manufacturing facilities, and he's doing everything. And I'm like. I'm listening to this book, this book on tape uh, and, or, or while traveling the last couple of days. And I'm just thinking like, it's making me sick to my stomach over what his home life is like. And I'm also like, man, I'm fired up at the same time because I realize how much he's achieving. But I think, you know, a lot of ex athletes have to try to figure that out of like, am I still trying to reach these personal goals or are my personal goals something that I can't really quantify anymore? But when you have these non-quantifiable goals and aspirations, it's it's something that's a little bit different for ex-athletes that have been used to every day being a competition and there's always a scoreboard. And now there is no scoreboard. Yeah, I mean, I I have the most respect for my friends who um, who are able to be successful in their profession but also be very present and – you know, be very present dads because I look, I just, I took a lot of those things for granted with my upbringing thinking, you know, life's easy. You know, my dad was able to balance being there for everything and also being very successful at what he did. And I just thought that was, you know, that's just part of it. And I, and as I get older, I realize how hard that is to, to put everything into one thing and then shutting it off and putting everything into something else while still, you know, you know, tagging to the, the other thing and, and having that balance of uber successful, you know, professionally and, 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 and seeing like how active people are. And I put you two in that group of being active dads and, and having an interest in, in raising your kids a certain way while also being, um, you know, very good at what you do during the day because that, I, I didn't realize it, but looking back, it, you know, it's a really, it's just, it's a challenge every single day. And, um, well, yeah, not only that, but like, if you're going to be there all the time, because you can always achieve more, especially in sales or like really any job though, is like the more you work, the more you'll achieve. Right. And so like, even every time you're there for kids game, whatever, Anytime you're not working, you're actually sacrificing something from the job, right? If you're doing a job that you like and it's not just clock in, clock out, getting my hours in kind of thing, like just to be home at five every day is an actual sacrifice that, you know, as a kid, you don't, you don't really get like, oh, we always have dinner on the family. That's how it is because dad's not working anymore. Mom's not working anymore. So they're just home for the family. You don't realize that like oftentimes they still left a pile of work at work in order to get home for the family right or you know you think about the vacations you think about you know just dad or mom being there for a three o'clock basketball game on a tuesday sometimes it's like oh yeah they actually are you know giving up something to be here because as a kid you're like why why is dad not here why is mom not here you know i do have to say i remember thinking for so long man my dad worked so hard he even on Saturdays, he'd go to the office from, you know, seven thirty in the morning, come home just after lunch. I was like, man, six days a week, this guy. And then I had kids, and I re- realized that Saturday he probably just wanted to watch college, oh, yeah. college football in his office. Well, that's his one, and I was one like, time of quiet. Yes, right? and like, I was like, uh, this explains so much. <laughs> like, no wonder he was like, oh, I gotta go to work. He's watching the Hawkeyes play Indiana or whatever. Just with nobody messing with them, and yeah. I respect, and I get it. I know we had this conversation earlier this year with we were we were drowning. You know, we had the twins were at I think about a year old at the time, and Fitz was two, and so it was just a crazy. It's been a crazy year, and and I was I was short on sleep and not doing well, and and just overwhelmed at work. And I brought it home one night, and and I remember Tori being like, if if you if you ever just need to go in on a Saturday, just let me know. Like I'll cover it. And I remember being like, 
I need to go in every Saturday. I need to go in every Sunday. I need to go in like, but like that's like, I'm always behind. And I think you just got to get used to like, especially when you have young kids in the house, like I am going to be behind all the time. And it's just weird for, I guess, going back to like the sports analogy, used to feeling like I'm, I'm always one step ahead. I'm always going to be out working. Now I'm always going to be, there's always going to be a mountain of work left at work. I'm always going to be not really kind of achieving quite what I think I could achieve if I, you know, worked more. Your boss must listen to the show. <laughs> Shout out Stephanie. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's my, I, I was, I've been traveling too much for work lately, so I've had too much time to think about uh, all of this. Yeah, I, I, I think parenting, coaching, and in my role, like just as a sales rep, there's so many things that I became better at as like a friend, husband, and um, I guess worker. Once I had kids, I it just it, something switched for me where um, I talked about this earlier, like. When I was 33, I felt like I was at my peak basketball wise because I had it was limited activity. I was like limited energy. Like I kind of knew how to like maneuver. And with kids, I feel like I've had this I don't know I, this ability to um, kind of minimize or skip steps with work wise. And it's and it's because I've tried to just balance these children and trying to get them trying to figure out what makes them tick and get them motivated to listen to me and 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 attack them not attack them but go at them the the way i think they want would want it versus the way i think they need it and i've used that in 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 my work where i'm like i just really want to get to know somebody personally versus just you know showing them features and benefits of whatever i'm selling and and so maybe working less, but, but achieving more because of that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the goal, right? How can we work less and achieve more? All right, Jack, this has been fun. Mark, any parting thoughts? No, thanks for having me on. Thanks for the invite, Jack. <laughs> uh, I didn't have much to say, but, uh, always, it's always, always good to get together with three, three Dodgers two gales one dodger but we're all four dodgers here this is fun i appreciate it i always like coming back to this show what do you um, think of the new studio studio's great we're in a basement um <laughs> it's nice and there's bats and some autographed basketballs and stuff it's cool i like it a lot it's moonlight Graham. yeah it's a pretty good pro Broadcasting to the heartland Sports stories for the every man It's Moonlight Grill, yeah Please follow us on Instagram You're loving us on Twitter too You download every part we do It's Moonlight Grail!